Today, of course, is our last class, and so we're going to be dealing with the trials and witness of Paul. Um, I'm going to be skipping some stuff in here, so I will be kind of filling in the gaps in between a few a few of these slides, because we only have, you know, 53 minutes to, to do this, and we still have quite a bit. In fact, Luke uh, focuses quite a lot of attention. There's a fairly large part of his uh, story of the early church in the book of Acts, that's focused on the after the third missionary journey of Paul, after Paul returns to Jerusalem, which we're going to talk about today. And I think there's a particular reason for that. You will remember that Paul had several, or Paul, Luke had several motivations in writing. He wrote as a theologian, he wrote as a historian, uh, but he also wrote as a diplomat. And what, what we mean by that is that Luke was very concerned. A lot of accusations had been made and were being made against Christianity. And quite often those accusations involved the idea that either Jesus or the followers of Jesus had done something that was against the law or that the Romans wouldn't accept or, you know, etc., etc. And the diplomat part of Luke was that he records in some detail what it is that Paul and others before Paul in Acts actually were saying and how the legal authorities responded to it. In fact, of note in this area, the part we're going to talk about today is Paul undergoes five trials. And uh, though everyone that's in front of a Roman authority, the Romans actually, the Roman authorities, the soldiers and whatnot, go to great lengths to protect Paul. And not only that, every time that he presents his case, when somebody's accusing him of something and he presents his case before a Roman authority, the Roman authorities find him without fault. They say he's not guilty of anything wrong. Now this this happened you know earlier as well. Um, the the pro, uh, procurator Gallo in, Phil, in Philippi, for instance, I'm stuttering here, in Philippi found no fault with Paul and wouldn't even hear the trial. Um, and over and over and over again this happens, and we're going to see that happening again today. And so one of the reasons why Luke goes into such detail in capturing all of these the events after Paul's third missionary journey when he gets seized by the Jews and arrested for his own protection by the Romans and sent to the Roman headquarters in Caesarea Maritima and then later, you know, is taken off to Rome. In every case, Luke is capturing the fact that the Roman authorities did not find fault with Paul. Okay, no matter what people were saying about it. So, <clears throat> so that's part of what we're going to look at today. I always include this as the general overview of um, what the Acts of the Apostles were about, the date it was written, the theme, the story of the early church, the purpose, um, the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises in the uh, growth of the church, and the basic outline. Now let's jump into this. Before I, before I start talking about this next section, I left out a few verses here where Paul arrives in Jerusalem. He is warmly welcomed by all of the brothers and sisters, it says. And again, uh, Luke is very careful to make sure that there's an egalitarian uh, approach. That The sisters are mentioned as often as the brothers are. There's very much a balance between the men and women in the early church. They visit James, James the Just, the half-brother of Jesus, who is the head of the Jerusalem Council, and receive his blessing and all of the elders with him. James reports to Paul that a rumor has gone out. You know, Paul, as he's traveled around to these Gentile areas, he's communicated with the Council of Jerusalem from Acts 15, we study. The Council of Jerusalem had decided that Gentiles did not have to be circumcised or obey the Mosaic Law in order to be a follower of Jesus. Well, the rumor had gotten back to the Jews in Jerusalem that Paul was going around telling everybody, including Jews, that they didn't need to be circumcised and didn't need to obey the law. So the Jews are gunning for Paul because they think he's trying to undermine the, the Mosaic Law for the Jewish people, which was not true. Um, Paul was only communicating what the early church had decided with regard to Gentiles not needing to be circumcised. Do you see that difference? And yet the rumors got out there, and so James actually recommends, because of this misunderstanding of what Paul had been doing, that Paul go through a purification rite, a Jewish purification rite, like the vow of the Nazarite is probably what it is. You remember we talked about that once before. Um, and that he do so with four other men that are there as a way of showing, no, look, I'm still a Jew. I'm not trying to stop being a Jew. I am still, well, and Paul would have said, he's under no obligation to obey the law in order to be saved, but that doesn't mean as a, as a Jew, if there are aspects of Jewish observation that will make Jews 
not be offended and more open to the truth of the gospel, he's happy to do it. You remember it was Paul who said, I become all things to all men that I might save a few. And that's exactly where Paul's going with this. So this he's been warned by James and the others that there are Jews gunning for him. Okay? Then we find ourselves in the 21st chapter, first chapter. When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd. I remember Asia um, is where Ephesus is. Asia is one of the places that Paul has been and been teaching a lot. So the very, you know, the, the zealous Jews from Asia would have known about Paul and would have been very unhappy with him because of the impact that he had. Remember the riot? And now this wasn't the Jews, this was the, the, the Gentile, the pagan Gentiles, but still the riot in Ephesus, for instance. That was in Asia. So um, Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Fellow Israelites, help us. Okay, should have been fellow Jews. If they're from Asia, they probably aren't really Israelites, unless you're using Israelite as a synonym for Jewish. Um, they weren't, they were they didn't live in Israel, in other words. This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our law, our people, and our law in this place. Everything. He's preaching against everything we believe. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. And Luke gives us a parenthetical explanation here. They had previously seen, seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. The whole city was aroused and the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut. Now a couple of things there. When they talk about Trophimus, the Ephesian, being seen with Paul and they're accusing him of bringing a Gentile into the temple. They're, they've actually uncovered, archaeological dips of, uh, digs have uncovered in Jerusalem two different signs that are about four feet tall. They're carved into stone. And it says, basically, no Gentiles beyond this point. It says, no Gentile is allowed to, to enter the temple area. If you do so, then you are responsible for your ensuing death. <laughs> That's literally how it says it. You, you will be responsible for your ensuing death. So Gentiles were not allowed into that part of the temple. Well, Paul had not done that. In fact, ironically, he had just gone through a ceremony of purification, which would make it pure in order to be able to go into the temple. Um, and so they're making all kinds of accusations, saying he said things he didn't say, and he'd done something he hadn't done, but they get everybody all roused up about it. They drag him from the temple. Now, there's the, the temple in Jerusalem is in the center of a series of concentric courtyards. All right? There is the temple itself with an immediate courtyard around that. And then there's, there's a larger courtyard, which is called the courtyard of the women. Then a lar much larger courtyard, which is called the courtyard of the Gentiles. Because the Jews carried out business in the temple courts, the Gentiles were allowed to go a certain distance because they could be customers. They might be interested in the marketplace that was there. Also, at the very outside boundary on the north side of the, I believe it was the north side, of the outside wall of the temple compound, you know, the largest courtyard, was the Antonia Fortress. This was the fortress of the Roman, the Roman barracks, as it's called in some places, and the place where the garrison, the Roman military garrison that was responsible for for Jerusalem stayed in the Antonia for, uh, Fortress, and it literally had doors that entered right into the courtyards of the temple. I mean, it's not like the, the Roman guards were on the other side of the city. They're right there. The Antonia Fortress is adjacent and open to part of the courtyards of the temple, which you will see in just a second. So it's also been noted that the idea that when they, they seized Paul, they dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the gates were shut that they were doing it in order to try to keep, you know, let's not have a riot here in the temple, let's keep everybody out. But the suggestion has been made that this is a symbol, and maybe even be a divinely anointed symbol, for the final rejection of the Jewish people against the gospel, and therefore a new openness to the Gentiles. Now, the Gentiles had already become Christians, there, was, there were Jewish Christians, and there would be again. But to a great extent, this was the point at which the mission to the, to the Jews was on a downhill slide from there on out, and the mission of the Gentiles continued to grow. Any growth in the church from this point on would be growth amongst non-Jews, not amongst Jewish people. 
And to that extent, the doors of the temple were shut when Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, was dragged out. Okay? All right, let's keep going here. While they were trying to kill him, and the word they used there could, could might be interpreted lynch, you know, they, they, were, they were planning to kill him. News reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. Actually, it was just right around the temple. But um, he at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. Again, Antonia Fortress is right there. They just went out one side of the fortress where their barracks were, and they're in the temple courtyards. When the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. You need to understand that in all of the areas where the Romans, the Romans actually, for whatever reputation they may have today, the Romans were fairly open-minded and generous with the people they conquered. They let them run their own business. The one thing they would not allow, well, besides not paying taxes and not honoring the emperor, but the other thing they would not allow is they would not allow uh, any disruption in public order. Any riot, any upheaval, anything like that, they clamped down mercilessly because they would not have, they were always afraid that people, you know, that the, the Jewish people were a conquered people and there was always a fear they were going to rise up. Well, the way you keep them from rising up is that the slightest suggestion of any insurrection or violence or rioting or anything like that, you clamp down on it. You do not let it get, get carried away. That's why in Ephesus, the city official who talked to the people in, in the, you know, when they were stomping their feet and yelling, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, this great riot. The city official made several points, and his last one was, and not only, you know, besides everything else, you guys keep this up and the Romans are going to come in here and shut you all down, and you know what that looks like. You know, when the Romans came in to put down an insurrection, the way they did it quickly was they killed a few people right off the top, and arrested a bunch of people and had them flogged, many of whom would then die. And so you didn't want to mess with that. Um, so that's what's happening here, is they come in to shut this thing down. And immediately the crowd stops beating Paul. Because they're not going to keep um, doing that while the Rome, when the Romans show up. The commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. <laughs> First you arrest him and chain him. And then you ask him what the, who they are and what they're doing. Some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another, and since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. When Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great, he had to be carried by the soldiers to get him through this mob. The crowd that followed kept shouting, get rid of him. Now they get into the barracks, and Paul speaks to the Roman commander, and he speaks to him in Greek, and the Roman commander shocked. He says, I thought you were that Egyptian terrorist that got a bunch of people and had an insurrection a while back. You speak Greek? And Paul says, well, yeah, I, I'm from Tarsus. Tarsus was a major city. The University of Tarsus was the third uh, most significant university in the whole eastern Mediterranean region. So Tarsus, in fact, he calls it, in most translations, no mean city in the King James, or you know, a very significant city. I'm from a major city in, this, in the region, Cilicia, which is north. Um, and when he tells him that, that he's from Tarsus, that he's a Jew, he speaks Greek, he asks the commander's impressed, and he asks the commander, who turns out to be a fairly sensible and reasonable guy, um, can I speak to the people? You know, can we go back out here on the porch where they can hear me and I talk to the people? And the commander gave him permission. So they went back out the door, and there were enough soldiers there that people didn't, you know, rush Paul or whatever. And Paul starts speaking, this time in Aramaic. Paul was a very well-educated very smart guy. Later on you'll see that um, he's told your, your great learning has driven you mad. And he spoke a number of languages. So he goes back out and he starts speaking in Aramaic. And everybody starts listening. Aramaic was the common language of the people. It's a version of Chaldean, which was the Babylonian language that the Jews had learned when they were in captivity in Babylon. And it had become, because they were there for almost 70 years, you know, it's two generations or more, depending upon how you count a generation, that varies, um, the people had started speaking, their day-to-day -day language was the Babylonian language, Aramaic. And so Paul comes out, speak, having spoken Hebrew probably earlier, speaking Greek to the commander, he comes out and starts speaking Aramaic to the people. And he says, then Paul said, I am a Jew. Don't get confused about this, I'm a Jew. 
born in Tarsus of Cilicia, which was a province up just around the bend in the eastern part of the Mediterranean, just north of there, of Syria, and brought up in this city. You know, he, he considered Jerusalem his, his, his adopted home, even though he came from Tarsus. He lived many years in Antioch, of course. I studied, studied under Gamaliel, the great teacher, okay, grandson of Hillel, and Gamaliel was almost certainly the greatest of the Jewish teachers of his day. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way, which is what a common name for Christianity early on, to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison, as the high priest and all the council can themselves attest, because he had done it by commission of the Sanhedrin. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. If you hear a voice from heaven, it's always a good idea to call him Lord. <laughs> I am Jesus of, Na of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. That's a job to do. We all have a job to do, but the particular assignment. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. Paul then goes on to explain that when he got into Damascus, he was approached by a man named Ananias, who was a follower of the way, who laid his hands on him and prayed for him, and he regained his sight. He was baptized, and he was called at that point to be a witness to Jesus Christ, to the truth that he had experienced on the road to Damascus. And then Paul, everybody's listening to him at this point, and then Paul says, and that commission involved me going and sharing this message with the Gentiles. Oops. <laughs> I mean, not oops in terms of it was the wrong thing to say, because it was the right thing to say. But in terms of their perception of it, this was perceived, uh, they were right there with him when he was saying he was a Jew, but when he says that he is taking, as a Jew, an educated Jew, his job is to go and communicate with the Gentiles. You remember that Jews and Gentiles had nothing to do with each other. They wouldn't even eat, enter each other's home. They would not eat together. You know, complete separation. Well, all of a sudden, the people go back to the fact that they think that Paul is not following the law of Moses, that Paul is not respecting the things of the Jewish faith. All right? That's the, thing, the problem they had in the first place. And so we continue. The crowd listening to Paul... Until he listened to Paul, until he said this, that he had been called to go to the Gentiles. Then they raised their voices and shouted, Rid the earth of him, he's not fit to live. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, which apparently was symbolic of having heard a blasphemy. I mean, that's how seriously they thought this was. The commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. Flogging... You've probably, at Easter time, you've heard stories about what flogging was. When the Romans flogged, they used a thing called the flagella, which was a multi, you know, multiple strips of leather that would have bones or pieces of metal embedded in the end of it with a wooden handle. And so standard operating procedure was if you wanted somebody to tell you something, you flogged them. A lot of people died under flogging. Most of the people who didn't die were crippled for life. This was a very serious thing. Um, and yet, that's what you did. The commander saying, I want to find out more from this guy what's going on, so let's flog him. Okay. That's not, it's not like caning, you know, that you hear about so much about or whatever. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? Oh, by the way, one pregunta, question for you. Well, the centurion was the guard, uh, you know, was the commander over the hundred. The commander they keep talking about was his boss. When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do, he asked. This man is a Roman citizen. Roman citizens were not allowed to be tortured, which is what flogging was considered, 
or in any other way treated unfairly unless they had been tried and found guilty of something, or unless by order of somebody at a very senior level. Um, huge difference between Romans and, and everybody else. If you're a Roman citizen, you have rights. If not, you know, a commander of a, of a Roman garrison could have you flogged for any reason. If you died, big deal, if you weren't a Roman citizen. But if you're a Roman citizen, completely different set of rules. So now the commander has heard that Paul is a Roman citizen. He went to Paul and asked, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship, but I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Those who were about to interrogate him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. Again, Roman citizens had rights. And as you're going to see shortly, a Roman citizen, one of the rights they had was to go over anybody's head, all the way to the emperor. You could appeal all the way to the emperor in his court. It didn't mean everybody got to talk to Nero, who was the emperor then, but one of Nero's representatives. And all you had to do was say, I, I'm, I'm calling up my right to do that. So here... Paul is born a Roman citizen, which means his father, or maybe his grandfather, somewhere along the line, his, um, one of his paternal uh, ancestors, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, had become a Roman citizen, and therefore gets passed on into the members of the family. A person could become a Roman citizen by either earning it by some great service to the empire. You save the emperor's life or the life of a Roman senator or whatever, they'll make you, you, know, they'll make you a, um, a citizen. Or you join the military and rise up through the ranks and you're responsible for a military victory. If you're, if you're uh, in the military and you do something significant, they can award you with a Roman citizenship. Otherwise, if you're not born with it, you don't get awarded it for some reason. The only other way you can get it is by bribing somebody for it. When he said, I had to pay a lot of money for mine, you couldn't pay for it, but you could bribe a senior Roman official who had the power to make someone a citizen, and they would make you a citizen. So that's what Claudius Lysias, who that's who we're talking about here, you'll see his name in a minute, um, he had had to purchase his with a, a very expensive bribe, but Paul was born as a citizen. So the commander, still trying to find out what's going on, releases Paul, at least formally releases Paul, meaning probably takes the chains off. But then he says, look, I've got to get to the bottom of this. Now this commander would, be, would have been a, a, a man of some rank, yet centurions reporting to him. He was responsible for this whole garrison. He wasn't, he wasn't just a common soldier. He had some power himself. In fact, later on, when, when the governor, Felix, uh, is, has Paul presented to him. One of the problems Felix has is that if uh, Claudius Lysias, the commander here, if he did not find any fault, it would be very difficult for Felix to claim that he found fault. Because Claudius Lysias, this commander, was a man of some authority himself. All right? So, Claudius Lysias orders the Sanhedrin to meet again and for Paul to appear so that he can try to figure out what the heck's going on here. So here we come to the... Um, the tr first trial before the Sanhedrin. That's not here. I'm just mm -hmm. going to tell you about it. Uh, Paul goes before the Sanhedrin. Yes? Who exactly are the Sanhedrin again? That, that's the ruling council of the Jewish people. Okay. Uh, there, there are officially were 70 of them. Mm -hmm. It was predominantly run by the Sadducees, although there were Pharisees who were members as well. Gamaliel, who was a Pharisee, was one of the members. Paul may himself have been kind of a junior member. But at one point, prior to all this, of course, when he was still Saul. But they were the, the governing council. They ran under the Roman authority, of course. They were the, in charge of running the country under the Romans. But they were also the religious authority. Now, prior to the Romans taking over, they had, they had authority all the way up to the point of uh, having people executed. Under the Romans, one of the things the Romans said in order from, to keep things from getting out of hand is that uh, anybody who they conquered they could no longer decide to execute people. They had, if they had somebody that needed to be executed, they could try them, but then they had to bring it to the Romans, and the Romans had to agree. That's what happened with Jesus. Okay, so originally when Paul was going under the Sanhedrin to, uh, to uh, arrest Christians, mm -hmm. he, he would have had the Sanhedrin's okay, but they would have also had the Romans okay? No, well, they, the, the, the Romans gave them freedom to run things the way they wanted, up to a point. And that point was, you don't execute anybody without, without us saying so. Okay. The, the uh, stoning of Stephen, for instance, was a criminal act, according to the Romans. 
Because no matter what he had done, no matter what he had said, no matter what, whether the Sanhedrin had actually met and convicted him of something that, was, uh, that called for um, uh, him to be executed, they were not permitted to do that without Roman approval. So when Paul was going to get these people, you notice it didn't say he was going to get them to kill them. He was going to arrest them to bring them back to Jerusalem for trial. And at that point, if the Sanhedrin had said, yes, these people are heretics and they deserve to be executed, they would have legally had to go to the Romans and ask for permission to do it. Or, or actually, technically, gone to the Romans and said, would you kill them for us? Which is what happened with Jesus. That's why it's the Romans that crucified Jesus, not the Sanhedrin. Okay? That's why they had to work so very hard to try to convince Pontius Pilate to actually agree with them and approve the execution of Jesus. Okay? All right. So the Sanhedrin is the ruling council. Um, Paul testifies to the Sanhedrin many of the same things. He starts out by saying, first, to this very day my conscience is clear. Reaction is Ananias, the high priest, who was a thoroughly horrible person. Josephus and others from that time tell us that, for instance, Ananias loved money, and he had made himself very wealthy by stealing money from the temple. He, um, uh, he was ruthless, he was power hungry, there's no good reports about him anywhere. Okay, so Ananias, when Paul starts out by saying, all right, I'm here to talk to you today, and I want to start by saying, my conscience is clear, I've not done anything to offend God to this day. Ananias orders somebody to hit Paul in the mouth. Paul does not respond well to that. He says, you whitewashed wall, you know, God will judge you for that. Because, and that was a violation of the law. I mean, somebody comes, somebody is called to, to testify before court, and they say something somebody doesn't like, so they smack them. Can you see that happening in a court of law? Well, same thing. It wasn't legal in their court of law either. And so when they hit him, and Paul responds the way he does, somebody says to Paul, how dare you insult God's high priest? And Paul says, I'm sorry I didn't realize that's who that was, um, because... Scripture says you should respect your country's um, you know, leaders, your people's leaders. Well, we're not sure if Paul's being facetious or if Paul actually didn't recognize that Ananias was the high priest. It could be that they called this thing very quickly. You know, it just sort of happens like this. And maybe he wasn't wearing his, his formal robes or whatever, and so he didn't recognize him. The most likely thing, I think, and that some other scholars think, this isn't original to me, is that you'll remember that we believe Paul had very bad eyesight. And so it's very possible, for instance, even when he said, you whitewashed wall, he may have just been referring to the fact that all he could see was this fairly large, you know, corpulent man in, in the white robe. And he may not have been able to recognize him as an eye, uh, Ananias because his eyesight was so bad. So that may have been why he responded the way he did, not recognizing him because his eyesight was so bad. We don't know for sure. But Paul, after um, sort of apologizing, Unless he was being facetious, and we don't know. We'll ask him someday. Paul then identifies himself as a Pharisee. He's before the Sanhedrin. The majority of the Sanhedrin were Sadducees, but there were a lot of Pharisees as well. And he says, I am a Pharisee. I was born a Pharisee. I was raised a Pharisee. I am still a Pharisee. I'm a Pharisee. And the reason I'm here today, the reason I got in trouble is because I am preaching the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. They didn't believe in angels or demons or a bunch of other stuff. They only looked, They only took the books of the law, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, the books of Moses. They did not accept any of their prophets or any of the other writings. The Pharisees were absolutely adamant that all of the Hebrew Bible was God's word and had to be respected. They believed in the resurrection. You know, the, one of the reasons the Sadducees, because we don't believe that, is most of that stuff is not found in the books, in the first five books of the law. It's found later on in the Bible, okay? So the Pharisees believe in the resurrection, they believe in angels, they believe in demons, and this is a big, you know, theological bone of contention between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So Paul, being a very smart guy, he's standing in front of the Sanhedrin, which is made up of both Sadducees and Pharisees, who are always arguing about this stuff, and he says, I'm a Pharisee! So all of a sudden the Pharisees say, okay, he's one of ours. And then he says, the reason I'm here in trouble is because I'm preaching resurrection of the dead. And the Pharisees say, we like him. He's our guy. We, I don't, there's nothing wrong with him. He's fine. And the Sadducees start going, no, no, wait, you kidding me? And they, then this big kerfuffle starts. So for the second time, 
the Romans have to take Paul out and take him back to the barracks because now the Sanhedrin is going at each other. All right, Paul has set them off. Now, um, the commander removes Paul. That night, Paul has a vision from God reassuring him and telling him, just as you have testified to me in Jerusalem, you will now testify to me in Rome. Which may be one of the reasons Paul later you know, calls on his rights to appear before the emperor, because God has spoken to him and said, you're going to go to Rome. Um, and then we discover that there's a conspiracy, that 40 Jewish men have pledged that they will neither eat nor drink until they assassinate Paul. Well, Paul's nephew, his sister's daughter, we know nothing else about his sister or his nephew, except this reference. His sister's son, his nephew, hears about this, and he goes to, to gets in to see Paul and tells Paul, Paul tells the commander, the commander, or tells the, the uh, centurion guard, the centurion tells the commander, the commander calls Paul's nephew and says, tell me what you know, what you heard. He tells him, and the commander says, okay, don't tell anybody about this, and he sends him out. Oops, there again there, sorry. Then he, the commander, called two of his centurions and ordered them, get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen. Now, the word spearmen here may be extra horses. Okay, the word may, it may not be that there were 470 guys. There were still 270, and they had extra horses in case they needed them. But anyway, um, lots of soldiers. Get them ready to go to Caesarea at 9 tonight. This is Caesarea Maritima, the great city that Herod the Great had built, where the Romans had, it was a coastal city, a, literally a, an artificial concrete harbor that Herod had built, that the Romans had made their center um, that was north on the coast, up in the Phoenician area. And so, get ready, we're going to go to Caesarea and take Paul there at 9 o'clock tonight, provide horses for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix, who is the governor of the whole region. He wrote a letter as follows, Claudius Lysias to His Excellency Governor Felix greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and they were about to kill him, but I came with my troops and rescued him, for I had learned that he, was a, he is a Roman citizen. Now, Claudius Lysias for the most part tells the truth. But he bends the truth a little bit in order to make himself look as good as possible. All right. Instead of him just grabbing this guy because there's, there's something going on, they're about to kill this guy, and so I can find out what it is, got to stop it and pull him out of there, he reports that he had heard he was a Roman citizen and so went to do something about it, okay, etc. I wanted, I wanted to know why they were accusing him, so I brought him to their Sanhedrin. I found that the accusation had to do with questions about their law, but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. Again, Claudius Lysias is himself a man of some authority. You'll notice he's got multiple centurions. You know, he's got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of soldiers under him. So he's not a lightweight. He states right here, I looked into this, and I found nothing that no charge could be held against him that deserved death or imprisonment. When I was informed of a plot to be carried out against this man, I sent him to you at once, I also ordered his accusers to present to you their case against him. So he went back to the Sanhedrin and said, Paul's gone, you now have to go and make your case to the regional governor, Felix. So the soldiers, carrying out their orders, took Paul with them during the night and brought him as far as Antipatris, which is a city about halfway. The next day they let the cavalry go on with him while they returned to the barracks. When the cavalry arrived in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. The governor read the letter and asked what province he was from. Learning that he was from Cilicia, which is where Tarsus is, that's his home province, he said, I will hear your case until your accusers get here. Then he ordered that Paul be kept under guard in Herod's palace. Okay. Five days later, so Paul's being kept at the Herod's palace, which was, he's basically in prison, but a nice prison in Caesarea. Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus, a Latin name. Okay, you get a bad vibe about this right from the start. A lawyer with a Roman name. And they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. When Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. 
We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere, in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. But in order not to weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. Okay. Talk about sucking up. <laughs> Everything, now it was customary in the courts in those days that when you, begin, when you appear before a judge, you start out by saying something complimentary, etc. But this whole thing is such a crock because Felix was renowned for being a horrible governor. In fact, after two years, he got called back to Rome to answer for being such a bad governor. One of the things that he was guilty of is that whenever there was any, any question of, of problems between people, he, his, his resort, he resorted to brutality. I mean, absolute brutality. There had been a disagreement between some Syrians and some, you know, some other folks, and you know, they were disagreeing over some land rights or whatever. Well, he goes in and just massacres a bunch of people over this. Um, and so he was a horrible guy. He didn't bring peace. He didn't bring positive reforms. Um, and the, the Jews were not grateful. They hated this guy. Okay? But he's a lawyer. So he says this stuff to try to impress the judge. And he goes on. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots around, among the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple. So we seized him. Not we tried to lynch him. We seized him. You'll notice the, the accusations. He's a troublemaker. Remember, to the Romans, that was one of the most serious things you could be. Because troublemakers, anybody who starts making trouble, that could be the start of a whole insurrection. So if you're a troublemaker, the Romans' ears perk up. Okay. Um, stirring up riots, that's what they won't stand for. He's a ringleader of the Nazarene sect, which to the Jews was a horrible thing, and tried to desecrate the temple, which simply is not true. Two of these three things would have no particular concern to the, to the Romans. They were Jewish. The Nazarene sect, at this point, they didn't have anything against the Nazarene sect. And secondly, you know, he desecrated the temple. By examining him yourself, you will be able to learn the truth about all these charges we are bringing against him. The other Jews joined in the, accus in the accusation, asserting that all these things were true. Now, once again, Felix calls uh, on Paul, and Paul gives his statement briefly and clearly. He, and he starts out with, a, with a, a positive statement, just saying, Felix, since you're in charge, and you've been around a while, you know how these things work, I'm happy to be able to tell you what's really happened here. So he's, he's polite, but he doesn't suck up like Tertullus has just done. He briefly starts telling his story about how he had just returned to Jerusalem. He was not stirring anybody up. He was not arguing with anybody. There was no crowd. There was no disturbance. The problem was that some of these Jews simply don't like the things he has to say, even though everything he has to say is consistent with the Jewish expectations that they just saw it. And particularly, he says, it's because I believe in the resurrection. And there's a controversy over that. Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, Christianity, adjourned the proceedings. When Lysias the commander comes, I will decide your case. Again, even as the governor and the senior guy in this whole area for the Romans, if a commander, Claudius Lysias, has already decided and written that he found, he looked into this and found no fault, then Felix is kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. If he lets the guy, if he lets Paul go, the Jews are going to give him all kinds of grief, and there was always, they were always trying to keep there from being a problem. This is why Pilate was giving in on things as well, because you didn't want to foment a riot yourself and then have to put it down and have your bosses in Rome get mad at you over it. But on the other hand, he couldn't find the guy guilty. He couldn't find Paul guilty because he's already had one of his senior officials look into this closely, supposedly, and say he hasn't done anything wrong. So he's kind of caught. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. One of the things that used to happen in ancient prisons, if you were in prison, they didn't feed you. Your, if your friends and family and friends didn't bring stuff, you starved to death, or you froze to death if you didn't have blankets and clothes. They didn't provide anything. Now, Paul is in a different situation here, but um, they're making a point of saying, okay, he's not some low-life prisoner. Take care of him. Be nice to him. You know, we don't know what's going on here yet. And he is a Roman citizen, remember. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. 
Drusilla, by the way, was the daughter of Herod Agrippa I, which means she is the sister of Herod Agrippa II and Bernice, whom we're about to meet in a few minutes. So she is of the house of Herod. She's Herod the Great's great-granddaughter. All right? He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. <laughs> Why was he afraid? Because Felix is listening to this saying, okay, I am not righteous, I don't have self-control, and I've had really bad judgment. <laughs> Okay, so that's why he's made afraid by this, as he hears Paul talking about this kind of righteousness, and Felix knows that that's not who he is, and it bugs him. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bride. There's the not being so righteous part. So he sent for him frequently and talked with him. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, but because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. What happened, which we find out from other historians, particularly Josephus, is that Felix was recalled to Rome to answer for failings as a governor, for his brutality, for the fact that everybody was, you know, hated him, he was not a good local ruler, um, and the, the idea about uh, wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, the Jews were the ones that were making accusations against him, to, the, to Rome, saying he... You put him in charge, and here's how bad he is. It's as though Felix is saying, I don't want to give him one more thing to complain about. Not one, I'm, I'm about to be put on trial here. I don't want one more accusation made against me, so I'm not going to do anything for Paul. The guy who came in, Portius Festus, we don't know much about except what we see here, and some, uh, he only lived for two years after this. Festus only, was only governor for two years, and he died. But he appears to be not only wiser, but fairer and more honest than any of his predecessors or any of his successors. The guy that came after him was even worse than Felix had been, the one that came before Festus. Festus seems to be unusually wise and honest. Okay. So the new, new guy, Horses Festus, shows up. Three days after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Okay, this guy's a hard worker. He's just traveled here from Rome over land which probably took weeks and weeks, and very uncomfortable, you'd think he's going to say, okay, I'm going to take a couple weeks, all right, test out the Mediterranean waters here. No, three days after he arrives, you know, barely enough time to unpack his duffel, he leaves Caesarea Maritima, the headquarters, and goes down to Jerusalem, because that's, the headquarters, that's where the people he's now in charge of are centered. Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem, always up if you go to Jerusalem, always down if you come from Jerusalem, where the chief priests and the Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. They requested Festus as a favor to them to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem, for they were preparing an ambush again to kill him along the way. Okay, it's been over two years, so those guys who said they weren't going to eat or drink until they killed Paul, they're either dead or they, you know... Move to Idaho. There's something else. Okay. Um, but these other, now they still want to ambush Paul. Festus answered, Paul is being held at Caesarea, and I myself am going there soon. Let some of your leaders come with me, and if, here's the fairness, if the man has done anything wrong, they can press charges against him there. I'm not going to make the assumption that he's a bad guy just because you say so. After spending eight or ten days with them, Festus went down to Caesarea from Jerusalem. The next day, hard worker, okay, two-day trip, he turns around the next day and follows up on what he said he was going to do. He convened the court in order that Paul be brought before him. When Paul came in, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him. They brought many serious charges against him, but they could not prove them. Then Paul made his defense. I have done nothing wrong against the Jewish law or against the temple or against Caesar. And he continues with his defense. And Festus responds. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, you know, he's not, he's not, there's nothing dishonest in this. He's now in charge of these people, and they had a really bad experience with the previous governor. So he wants to appear to be fair. He wants to do whatever he can, not, not to do anything against Paul, but he wants to do what he can for them, because he's now their ruler. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, are you willing to, 
to go to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges. Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I have not done anything wrong to the Jews as you yourself know very well. Festus was a smart guy, he could tell. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. If I've done something wrong, even, even if it's, if it's a, you know, a capital offense, something I would be executed for, I'm, I'll accept that, if I've done something wrong. But I haven't. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar, which again was his right as a Roman citizen. After Festus had conferred with his counsel, he declared, You have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you will go. And again, remember, one of the reasons Paul probably did this is because God had told him in a vision that as he had testified to him in Jerusalem, he would now do so in Rome. And this is how Paul gets to Rome. All right? We then get uh, Herod Agrippa. This is Herod Agrippa II. Again, the brother of Drusilla, who is the wife of Felix, the last governor, who is now in Rome answering for his, his malfeasance. Um, and his sister Bernice, it says Agrippa and Bernice, Bernice isn't his wife, Bernice is his sister. These are the great-grandchildren of Herod the Great. Herod Agrippa II was the son of Herod Agrippa I, the guy who had had James, the brother of John, killed. Right? He's the grandson of Herod Antipas, who had John the Baptist killed. The great-grandson of, of Herod the Great, who tried to kill Jesus when he was a baby. Great lineage. Okay. <laughs> So Herod Agrippa drops by with his sister Bernice. He is the king of part of the area of Judea, <coughs> having inherited it. He comes by to welcome Festus to his new post, sort of as fellow rulers. Um, and Festus tells Agrippa and Bernice about Paul and the situation. And Agrippa says he'd like to talk to this guy. I'd like to meet this guy. So we then have this. The next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking military officers and the prominent men of the city. At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa, and all who are present with us, you see this man. The whole Jewish community has petitioned me about him in Jerusalem and here in Caesarea, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. I found he had done nothing deserving of death. Again, Luke is telling us consistently that the Roman authorities do not find fault either with the Christian faith or with those who represented, in this case, Paul. He had done nothing that deserving of death, but because he made his appeal to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome. I have nothing definite to write to his majesty about it. Therefore, I brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that as a result of this investigation, I may have something to write about. Help me figure out how I can even describe this, because I don't quite understand it yet. For, think, uh, for I think it is unreasonable to send a prisoner on to Rome without specifying the charges against him. Now, Agrippa, who's been given, uh, a yeah, he's been given by Festus, it's Festus's audience hall, Festus has said, okay, Agrippa, take it away. You know, you can sort of run the interview since you want to talk to this guy. So Agrippa tells Paul, he may speak for himself, Paul once again, and it's great to go back and read these, you know, these testimonies by Paul. I'm sorry we don't have time to do all this today. Paul tells his story of how he was a good and zealous Jew, about how he was converted on the road to Damascus, how he came to preach about Jesus, that he was seized by the Jews in Jerusalem, even though nothing that he had said was against God, or against Moses, or against the law, or the history of the Jewish people. In fact, that it was a fulfillment of the Jewish expectation that the Messiah would come, and that the Messiah would come not only for the Jews, but for the Gentiles as well. Who's he talking to? Gentile rulers. At this point, Festus interrupts Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul. Paul, you just told us this Messiah was, came to save us. You're out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. <laughs> Paul was a smart guy. I once taught a class called Really Smart People Who Believed in Jesus. Paul was one of them. Actually, I don't think I included Paul. I started with Boethius, but I could have. Carolyn came up with the name. <laughs> really smart people believe in Jesus. I am not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. God wants us to use our reason. Paul was a reasonable man. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice, because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, 
Do you believe in the prophets? I know you do. Talk about bold. <laughs> then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, Short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. The king arose, and with him the governor and Bernice, and those sitting with them. After they left the room, they began saying to one another, This man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, That man, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. They found no fault. Okay? Now, quickly here, we get Paul headed to Rome. First, start at chapter 27. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, you'll notice the we. Luke went with him. Luke, apparently, during the two years that Paul was imprisoned in uh, Caesarea, Luke had gone there with him, had gone to come back to, the, to Palestine with him. The indication is that Luke must have spent those two years doing something else, probably interviewing all the people that he needed to interview to get the reports that he needed to write the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. Okay? Because he hadn't been there for all of that. When it was decided we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to the centurion named Julius, who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. We boarded the ship from uh, Adramantium, Adramidium, excuse me, about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia, and we put out to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. We then have great detail about this trip, how they stopped in Sidon, in Myra, they went to the island of Crete, and on Crete, Paul warned them. It's getting very late in the year. In the Mediterranean Sea, especially the eastern Mediterranean, um, it's like we have rainy seasons. Well, they have a stormy season. You know, hurricanes come at a certain time of the year in the Caribbean, for instance. Well, there's a certain, after a certain time of the year, you don't want to be sailing in that part, at least in the main body of that part of the Mediterranean. And Paul warned them and said, guys, if you do this, there's going to be great loss to the ship and to lives. Later on, he says, okay... God has told me that nobody's going to die, but the ship's not going to survive. They hit this big storm. They are shipwrecked on the island of Malta. They spend quite a bit of time there. And at first, Paul impresses them because they're building a fire on the beach because they're all soaking wet. They, they, they barely made it to shore, but they all did. And he's, he reaches into a pile of firewood and he gets bitten by a viper. Apparently it latched onto his hand. Very poisonous snake. Paul shakes it off in the fire and they all say, well, he must have offended the the gods because he's about to die. He's fine. So they're all very impressed by the fact he was bitten by this poisonous snake and it didn't hurt him. He ends up healing the father of Publius, the governor of Malta, and then ended up having a healing ministry for the whole island. After spending some time there, we have, after three months, we put out to sea, this is from Malta, in a ship that had wintered on the island. It was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods, Castor and Pollux. Roman gods, Castor and Pollux, were the uh, sons of Zeus, oh no, I'm sorry, Greek gods, were the sons of Zeus, and were considered the patron saint gods, sort of, the patron gods of sailors. Okay. We put in at Syracuse and landed and stayed there three days. From there we set sail and landed at Regium. The next day the south wind came up, and on the following day we reached Puteoli. We're there in Italy now. There we found some brothers and sisters who invited us to spend a week with them, and so we came to Rome. The brothers and sisters there had heard that we were coming. They traveled as far as the form of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. At the sight of these people, God thanked, uh, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier and a guard him. Again, treated very respectfully. This is what this trip was. From Jerusalem, they were taken, he was taken up to Caesarea, two years. Then they set sail, Sidon, Myra, uh, the Isle of Rhodes, Ninus. Snidus, C-N-I-D-U-S, I'm not sure how you pronounce Snidus. And then the Isle of Crete, and then this is the international symbol for a big storm. <laughs> and then shipwrecked on Malta. Then from Malta, after spending time there, they got a boat to Syracuse on Sicily. Then Regium, which is actually in Italy. Then Puteoli, the, and, and on up to Rome. Okay? So that's the trip to Rome. Five more minutes will be done. And then you get to take the test under your elections. <laughs> oh, sorry. Three days later, he called together, that's Paul, called together the local Jewish leaders. When they had assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. 
They examined me and wanted to release me, the Romans didn't have a problem with it, because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. The Jews objected, so I was compelled to make an appeal to Caesar. I certainly did not intend to bring any charge against my own people. For this reason, I have asked to see you and to talk with you, the Jewish leaders in Rome. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. That's, he would have been chained to the guard. They replied, we have not received any letters from Judea concerning you. They hadn't heard of him. And none of our people who have come from there have reported or said anything bad about you. But we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking about this sect. We haven't heard of you, but we know about this, you know, this sect of people believing that the Messiah is come. And the last slide at the very end. He preaches, he ministers to them, he teaches them, and some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed amongst themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. Paul gives them both barrels here at the end. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to our ancestors when he said through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears. They have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. Because you Jews will not receive it, the Gentiles will. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Exclamation point. This is the end of the book of Acts. It ends on a minor, minor note. It's like uh, something else should come. That's why some people believe Luke may have intended to write a third book to talk about the rest of what happened in Rome and what happened after that. Tradition. This is the last official record we have of what happened to Paul. But the unofficial tradition, and it's, it's pretty strongly attested to, is that Paul was not executed. He was tried in Rome and released. And as he has said in several places, twice in one chapter of Romans, he wanted to go to Spain, which was Spain and Britain were the furthest extensions of the Roman Empire. Now, Britain actually was. And the tradition is that he went to Spain. Part, some traditions even say he went as far as Britain. Came back, and when he came back, he was arrested again and tried and executed sometime around 67 to 69 AD. All right? That's just tradition. We don't know for a fact. Yes. Questions about any of that? It doesn't say why he was arrested when he came back. No, uh, but that was the point. When he came back would have been after the start of the persecution against the Christians by Nero. Nero was the emperor during this time. Well, Nero, you remember the story of Rome burns down. Historians now are pretty sure Nero really didn't have anything to do with that. He was not in town when it started, um, and even though Nero was saying he was a maniac, okay, there's no question about that. Um, we don't think he actually burned down the city, but the word got around that Nero had set fire to Rome himself because he wanted to rebuild it the way he wanted it. Well, no matter what they tried to do, people wouldn't, it get, kept getting more and more and more people started believing this story that Nero had burned down Rome because they didn't have, uh, the city of Rome, because they didn't have any other reason. Well, in order to try to take the heat off himself, Nero blamed the Christians. The Christians were not popular anyway. They simply didn't go along with everybody else. They would not go to public events because at every public event they would acknowledge the gods. So Christians wouldn't do that. They wouldn't sacrifice to the emperor. They wouldn't do any of that. And so they were not liked. So they were a natural target. Nero blamed them for Rome being burned. There was a persecution that started against the Romans. Well, it was around that time that Paul and Peter both end up in Rome and both are executed. Again, according to tradition. That... Uh, Peter was crucified, since he was not a Roman citizen, crucified upside down by his own request because he did not feel worthy to, to die in the way that his Lord Jesus had. Again, just tradition. And that uh, Paul, because he was a Roman citizen, was beheaded. Alright? And it makes sense, the timeline, because by that time when he came back would have been at the height of the Neronian, uh, Neronian persecution of the, the Christians. Okay. Alright? Any questions, comments, anything else? Ready to take a test? You want to take a five-minute break? Yes.